This is a fan-generated show. If you'd like to support us, please go to jamieglazov.com. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our new Rumble channel. All your support is greatly appreciated. Good evening. Welcome to the Glazov Gang. Tonight, the KGB's infiltration of the Catholic Church. With us this evening, Paul Kengor, a professor of political science at Grove City College, and he is the author of many books, including The Devil and Karl Marx. He is the co-author of the new book, The Devil and Bella Dodd, One Woman's Struggle Against Communism and Her Redemption. Paul, what an honor to have you back on the Glasoff Gang. Jamie, you're, you're too nice, but it's always good to be with you. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, what a book. Uh, you know, Whitaker Chambers, obviously, what a powerful story. Bella Dodd, unfortunately, is not as well known. And uh, it's so great that you, that you, you know, gave her this limelight. Why don't we just start with that? What, what inspired you to write this book on Bella Dodd? Well, first of all, I think your analogy there is very apt. I mean, we all know about Whitaker Chambers, right? And but but really, Bella Dodd was kind of a female version of Whitaker Chambers, and she became this courageous witness to the truth. She died a few years after he did. He died at the start of the 1960s, and she died at the end of the 1960s. And you know, both of them, neither of them lived very long. In fact, I'm running through this. Or through the top of my head right now. How old was Chambers, Jamie? I think about 60, maybe, when he died. And yeah. um, Bella Dodd was, I think, 64, 65 when she died. But but she was, she was one of the most high-ranking women in the Communist Party. She became this, this master infiltrator, first of the teachers' unions for the party, then all sorts of other groups, you know, the longshoremen, the you know, every front, every communist front group under the sun you can imagine, and I know we'll get to this, but the party eventually went to her and asked if she could help them infiltrate churches and specifically Catholic seminaries, and she saluted the red flag, but uh, and tried to do that. But to back up a little bit, she was born in Paterno, Italy, in 1904. So this idyllic upbringing, this this girl with this beautiful Italian Catholic name, Maria Assunta Isabella Visono, which means um, you know, Mother Mary, the Assumption. Uh, Bella means beautiful. The, the, the shepherd who literally raised her when her parents went to New York called her Carina, which means pretty in Italian. So, you know, Maria Assunta Isabella Carina Visono, what could go wrong, <laughs> right? Well, she, she goes to New York and meets up with her family, which had gone there ahead of her to start for a life of freedom and prosperity in New York. And, and Jamie, she fell quickly into the whole kind of socialist milieu in the, in the New York public school system. And then what really made it worse was this young, precocious, promising girl from Paterno, Italy, gets gobbled up by the universities, specifically Hunter College, which is on the Upper East Side of New York, and then Columbia, same place Whitaker Chambers went, same place Thomas Merton went, and she became a communist. And by 1932, man, she's working for the party, serving the party, doing all kinds of stuff for the party. She become a full-blown communist. Thank you, Paul. And you write about how this individual Sarah Parks brainwashed her, and later Sarah Parks kills herself. Uh, and I was thinking about Marx's daughters as well, about their, I think there were some suicides there that you had documented in your book. Very interesting, and that, you know, Bella also herself was very depressed and in despair on her journey. Whenever individuals are inside that satanic realm of communism, they're also suffering themselves very much. And uh, there's some kind of a suicide happening there. Paul, sometimes I just... Yeah, I'm really glad you're pointing that out because all the interviews that I've done, you're the only one that's flagged this, and it's very important. Uh, I mean, Whitaker Chambers was suicidal, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but but yeah, Karl Marx, Marx had two daughters, as you know, Jamie, who, 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 who killed themselves mm -hmm. 
they entered into suicide pacts with their husbands. And one of one of Marx's daughters was in a suicide pact with his son-in-law, Paul Lafargue, who was partly Cuban, which was a big deal to Marx. Wouldn't it be a big deal to me and you? It was a big deal to Marx and Engels because they were racists. Uh -huh. And so they call so they try to deduce with their scientific Darwinian accuracy how much Negro blood was in Paul Lafargue's veins. And in fact, they didn't use the word Negro. They used the other N-word. You get you you read letters in German between Marx and Engels, and they're filled with German except for one word that jumps out: N I G G, right? The the, the racial English yeah. American epithet for for the N word. So Paul ended up. The Marx called him gorilla or Negrillo. Mm. They joked about how he was one step closer to monkeys and the animal kingdom than the rest of us. Yeah, and yet they call everybody else racist, right? That's exactly. Right. Yeah, I mean, Patrice Cullors, the, the the founder of Black Lives Matter, calls herself a Marxist. Does she have any yeah. idea what Marx thought about black people? Absolutely, Paul. Paul, there's so much to discuss here. Uh, I'm so honored to have you here and to discuss this issue. It it just so many hours are not enough because this is the epicenter of the world struggle because it's Satan's attack on humans, on God's creation. Satan hates us. We're made in the image of God. He's trying to overturn and destroy everything God's created. And he does this through communism. Bella her herself in her testimony uh, called out Lucifer as being the head of all of this, uh, which you show in your book. Um, so I just want to kind of paint a picture here, just in terms of what's on my mind. What an important book, because the devil wants to infiltrate the seminaries. His main target is God's church, and he's obviously been doing a very good job because of this uh, individual we have that's the Pope now. And uh, we see what's going on, the great apostasy that's also been prophesied, but what Francis is doing to the Mass, and you know, in terms of my readings of what theologians explain, um, and, and Cardinal, uh, Archbishop Vigano, etc., um, that the weaker the Catholic Church gets, and now what they're going to do to the Mass and taking the Eucharist out of it, and that's going to happen very soon, what Francis is doing, there will be no deterrent to the Antichrist. And, and so that's what we're seeing now. It's some kind of very frightening time. Now, we know that Satan will not prevail. That's a whole other issue. We know that there is victory in Jesus, but there will be this period. And I think we're somewhere around there or close to it because of what's happening to the church. I'll try to get this all out very quickly just because your book is so much on my mind in the sense of when Bella says and admits and shares that she oversaw the infiltration of about a thousand of these agents into the Catholic Church, when we go ahead in time and we think about these problems with the, the sex abuse going on, when we think about Sister Lucia disappearing, because we know it's been proven by now that Sister Lucia was not the real Sister Lucia. So we have to wonder, what happened to the real Sister Lucia? Could, uh, could it have been that these evil infiltrators maybe had done something to her? But the, but the great... Um, and then they put in this weird replacement and all the forensic evidence shows it's not the same face, etc. It's very scary stuff. Uh, but just even the discrediting that came to the Catholic Church with all of these abusers and Malachi Martin has talked about how, you know, these satanic cults entered it, etc. This could very much be connected to this infiltration the KGB did and then these bad people do bad things and... As Bella said that you document, she was talking that one of the main purposes is not just to attack the church, but to make Catholics lose faith in the church. And uh, the KGB and Satan were very, very successful in all this, weren't they? Well, and, and I will give um, a couple citations here from actual congressional testimony. Uh, Louis Boudens, who was... Um, the editor of the Daily Worker, and was converted into the Catholic Church by Bishop Fulton Sheen, as was Bella Dodd. 
uh, while while Louis Boudin's name was still on the masthead of the Daily Worker, but <laughs> really impressive. But but Louis Boudin said in congressional testimony, he said um, they the communists have declared war on the Catholic Church as the source for obliterating all religion. And, mm -hmm. and in fact, prior to Louis Boudin's, you had had Earl Browder, William Z. Foster talk to Congress, testify to Congress about. Um, about about I mean he was he he was still a communist so he was very careful about what he said, ex communist Ben Gitlow, who ran for vice president of the United States on the Communist Party USA ticket twice behind uh, Earl Browder, he became an ex communist wrote I confess and and another memoir as well Louis Bu um, so Ben Gitlow testified Manning Johnson ex communist testified. Herb Philbrick testified, Louis Boudens testified right there, four cases of congressional testimony to the Senate, to the House of Representatives, all about communist infiltration of the American churches. And, and, and uh, Gitlow and Johnson and Philbrick talked mainly about the mainline denominations, Jamie, the Episcopal Church, the Presbyterian Church USA, the United Methodist Church. The, the, the big infiltrator of the United Methodist Church through a group called the Methodist Federation for Social Action was the Reverend Harry Ward, who was one of the founders of the ACLU. And as Manning Johnson said, he was known as the Red Dean among reverends who had, who had, penetrated, who, who had penetrated the churches for the Communist Party. So, so they had done all of that. They were doing it behind the Iron Curtain, through all the different countries in the Iron Curtain, the Russian Orthodox Church, was completely penetrated. So, so communists worldwide attempted to infiltrate and sabotage these faiths from within. So it, it should not surprise anybody listening now who thinks, ah, oh, this Bella Dodd stuff. I mean, really, place a, a place a bunch of communists in Catholic seminaries. They wouldn't have done that. Well, <laughs> of course they would. This is what they did. Now the question is. It's their main target. The Catholic Church is their main target. Yeah, if I mean, if they're going to target the teachers' union and the long, <laughs> the longshoremen, the you know, the the electrical workers, the coal miners, they're not going to target the churches. I mean, what they really hated was religion. Right, and and Paul, let me just throw this in here. So, you know. When Sarah Parks killed herself and everything that was happening there, it's interesting how you document that Bella says that she took, because that, that influenced her very much, Sarah's, uh, Parks's uh, suicide. And then Bella writes how she took a more deceptive road to annihilation because Bella's very honest looking back that she was walking with the devil that whole time working for communism and that it was annihilating her as well because the devil extorts such a price from your soul and your mind and your heart while you're dancing with him. Um, but sort of a great price for my company. I walked. Yeah. Yeah. And, outside, yeah. and so I'll just just want to just say just how much this is all on my mind, because I'm always thinking about our Blessed Mother Mary and how she's central to Russia and communism. Of course, the message of Fatima, Fatima's conversion, it's all so intertwined. And so this story very much sent, very much Mary plays a main role in almost every stage because when Bella comes to Fulton Sheen and, and, and she weeps and, he, and he's so loving to her, towards her, unlike the Communist Party was Bishop Sheen, and he hugs her and she says they end up kneeling in front of the Blessed Mother statue there. And then she was clutching the rosary after she left that meeting with Fulton Sheen and never let it go. And we know that the Communist Party, as you show their workers journal, whatever it was in the 50s, attacked Fatima. But, but fa yeah, the Daily Worker and the but Fatima and our Blessed Mother very much connected to all this and Bella was very close to our Blessed Mother in her prayers. And let me give us a little bit on that. Yeah, it's fascinating, isn't it? That when, so she leaves the party and the party expelled her. She wanted to leave, but they don't let you leave, right? They expel you. And she got a call from an AP reporter in 1948. And the AP reporter said, Dr. Dodd, we have a statement here from the party. Uh, which has just expelled you. It says that you are anti-Negro, 
anti-Puerto Rican, anti-Semitic, you know, just right down, right down the list, right? You know, right out of the playbook. Oh, oh we got somebody that we don't like. Uh, what should we call them? Hmm, let me see. Racist, <laughs> right? I mean, they've been, they've been doing this for a hundred years. And Bella Dodd said, I have no statement to make. Because, and Bella Dodd had done this to other people. When she was in the party, she had smeared people that way. She said, our job was to turn the, the person into a monster, to make him out to be anti this, anti that, anti black, anti Jewish, on on anything that they could. So she spends the next three years just wiped out. And in 1951, she is in Washington meeting with her congressman, McGrath. And, and, and he says, Bella, you look really troubled. Isn't there anything I can do for you? And, and she said, she said, no, I've got the KGB follow me and I got the FBI following me, right? She's, she's borderline suicidal. She's afraid of being pushed in front of, in front of a bus. And, 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 he, and he said, how about Bella, would you like to see a priest? And she said, yes. And it almost surprised her, Jamie, right? Where's that coming from? But she said, yes. And so Congressman McGrath turned to his secretary, Rose, and said, Rose, why don't you see if you can get Monsignor Sheen from Cal? Yeah, and I'm so sorry to interrupt, Paul, but throughout that whole time, she never stopped reading the New Testament. And I think that that's a part of this, but keep going. Yeah, that's exactly right. You know, still clinging to that childhood faith, like yeah. Manning Johnson, who was um, an African-American ex-communist, and for him, one of the things that really made him bolt the party was he couldn't stop going to church, Jamie. He just couldn't stop. And he, and he knew that he wasn't allowed to do that. So it was that, that closeness to God, that kind of, you know, that lingering of faith that kept them in there. But, but Bella Dodd said, said, okay, yeah, I'll meet with Fulton Sheen. And Sheen said, have her come over to my apartment tonight. So she goes to his apartment, knocks on the door, and she said it was just like on television. He shows up with a big pectoral cross and he reached out and he said, Dr. Dodd, I'm so glad you've come. And she said, he didn't say to me what the communists would say, you old hag, you know, you old bag, you Bolshevik piece of garbage, get out of here. You no good for nothing. You know, yeah. you would call her. And he said, please come in. And she came in and sat down and, and, and he said, I could tell there's something troubling you. And she said, how can you tell? And he said, we priests are like doctors of the soul. We can just look at a patient and tell that there's something troubling him. Yeah. And, and she just started to sob. He put his hand on her shoulder. She started to cry. And she said within a few minutes, she didn't even realize how she got there. Yet yeah. they are sitting there in his private chapel in front of a statue of the Blessed Mother. Yeah. And, and he said, Dr. Dodd, I'm going to be going to New York in the winter. Why don't you come see me at the offices of the Propagation of the Faith? And I'll give you instruction to come back into the church. And he mm. did. And she came back in April 7th, 1952, mm. St. Patrick's Cathedral. And then 20 days later, April 27th, 1952, in the New York Times, liberals listen, in the New York Times, there's an article which says uh, Bishop Sheen in Rome talks about red infiltration of priesthood. Mm. <laughs> it was the only time that Sheen ever talked about it publicly. I don't even know yeah. if he knew any reporters would be there. He was at, at a, an American Catholic church in Rome called Santa Susana. And he talked about how orders went out in 1936 in a large American city, which had been New York, right, to send out communists into the priesthood to infiltrate yeah. the priesthood. Clearly, Jamie, clearly, clearly, three weeks after he just heard Bella's confession, he's getting that from Bella Dodd. And, yeah. um, and Bella Dodd was, was involved in that effort to place communists into Catholic seminaries. And you got to wonder all the bad things happening in the church. And as I said, Malachi Martin was even saying that there's a satanic element there. The Satan is obviously waging a war on the church by infiltrating the church to make Catholics lose faith in their own church and also to have the world hate the church. And also, as I said, as the theologians explained, the weaker the church is, the more powerful the Antichrist is. So that's very escalating right now. Paul. In your book, you touch on so many things. It's so hard to know where to go to here. Just, just a fascinating read. Everything you write there, just so vital. Thank you for writing this. Now, you just mentioned something that's so much... Bella's life was just hell after she left the party. And so we know 
even with the left today, like, you know, just even during COVID or whatever, that I was at, you know, at a gym or whatever, and this lady wants me to take a video of her lifting some weight. And then before I start the video, she's like, oh, I need to put my mask on. My friends will be very critical. And why I'm telling that is because it's the same thing. It's a cult. And, and especially as Phyllis Chesler has documented with women, it's, it's harder for them to leave the, these cults because the clique is so important. For men, it's a little easier because that, that community of, men, we can stand alone more easier, but for the women, it's harder. And this particular woman, and I know many of them, and I'm not saying men weren't engaged in this well, but she was terrified that the group will disown her if she's not wearing a mask. And this is the same utopian cult as the same thing that we're discussing here because for Bella, as you show in, in the book, that everything in the Communist Party and with the left today, as we know, is whether you are loved or hated by your cult. And so you have to follow the party line. And so once you stop being a communist, like with David Horowitz, when he stopped being a leftist, you have no friends left. You're thrown into the rain and it's over. They will, no one will be your friend if you don't toe the party line. So her, she was literally annihilated on that level and didn't have one friend. Communication, right? Yes, didn't have one friend left. And I think that's very important that you bring that up because we think about the left today and I know many people in the left, they're just terrified not to get the, the booster. Even if they die, they'll still get the booster just to have their community and their social life because they'll be dropped within a blink of an eye for that, right? So, so they're not demonized and, they, and they're quickly dehumanized within the clique. I mean, they're, they're treated horribly. They're not granted the mercy, right, that Bishop Sheen extended. He, he was all mercy, right? These people were all hellfire, brimstone, and judgment. And the irony too, Jamie, right, is that, is that they scoff at religion when in fact uh, they're really treating their ideology like like a religious faith, right? Absolutely. Like the most the most fanatical, uh, you know, re religious fanatics. And Bella Dodd, they closed the circle around her and isolated her so much. They had prepped her so well, as you saw in the book. She wanted to have a family. She wanted to have children. And the communists said no. They 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 they, they want the party to to be your child. And Whitaker Chambers went through this too. When Whitaker Chambers' wife got pregnant, he just assumed that she would go have an abortion. Um, Alger Hiss's wife had an abortion, Priscilla Hiss, and it wrecked her. It emotionally and physically wrecked her for yeah. the rest of her life. I don't think they had another child af after that. Uh, I don't think they had any children. But 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 they, they were supposed to. You're supposed to. And, and the and the Communist Manifesto, Marx and Engels, it says abolition of the family! Exclamation mark. Even the most radical flare up at this infamous proposal of the communists. So they didn't want to just break down and take away your your religion, Judeo-Christian religion. They wanted to take away your family. And then they put you into the cult, right? The religious-like cult of the party where, uh, where they had excommunication, heretics, blasphemy, unlike anything you would see in any actual Christian or religious denomination because these people were merciless. No charity, all vice. Yes, thank you, Paul. And when we think about our Lord saying, be fruitful and multiply, for Satan, everything is the opposite. So for communism, which is satanic, and he's behind it, of course, they're trying to destroy the nuclear family. They're telling Bella, as they're telling everyone else, don't have kids, but also abortion, because child sacrifice is the epicenter of, of Satanism, and so communism very interlinked with abortion, as you documented, right? From the beginning. From the beginning, yeah. The uh, Lenin in June 1913, writing in Pravda, called for the, quote, unconditional annulment of all laws prohibiting abortion. And then when they got into power in 1917, 1918, they immediately made abortion the law of the land. It got so bad that by the late 1920s, early 1930s, uh, Joseph Stalin, Joseph Stalin in 1936 ab uh, banned abortion because he was afraid that there, there wasn't going to be any future Russia. You know, Russian women were already having three abortions for every live birth. Trotsky reprimanded him for that. You cannot be a good communist and ban abortion, comrade. Khrushchev brought it back in 1955. 
By the 1970s, this is incredible, but this is according to official Soviet health ministry statistics, they were averaging, the Soviet women were, were averaging seven to eight million abortions per year in the Soviet Union. In America, it was never higher than one to two million per year. And it was about equal population, probably a little more people in America at the time, but seven to eight million abortions per year in the Soviet Union in the 70s. You know, that's, uh, yeah, that's 70, 80, 90 million abortions in, in one decade. And to this day, the highest abortion rates are still in communist countries, Cuba, North Korea, former communist countries, Romania, and look at China, where, where they've had forced abortion. So this has been a culture of death in so many ways. And of course, we're even talking about gulags and other forms of, um, of, of abuse and death in the communist countries. But yeah, abortion has always been rife in communist systems. And, uh, and, and Bella Dodd saw that. Thank you, Paul. Absolutely, this war on God's creation, on his church, by Satan through communism, as you point out in your book, Soviets also with Andropov behind the attempt on Pope John Paul II's life. But let me ask this. Feast day of Our Lady of Fatima, May 13th, 1981. Absolutely. And, uh, and it was fascinating. You know, my dad, who, who was very, very, uh, he, Fatima, loomed very large in my dad's mind. He, he talked about it a lot and taught the fam, uh, taught us about it. And uh, But my dad always said when they brought the Pope to the hospital, they said, when, when did you eat? We have to operate and it's very dangerous if there's food in the stomach. And Pope John Paul II said, today's our, uh, we're commemorating Our Lady of Fatima. I'm fasting. I haven't ate. And that's, that's incredible. That's, that's absolutely incredible. But Paul, Bella Dodd, overseeing this infiltration of the Catholic Church, tells Fulton Sheen about it. We know that Fulton Sheen was on the front lines fighting the evil of communism, and yet he, t <clears throat> excuse me, and yet he tells her not to name names. Perhaps he was worried, as you, uh, your, your thinking in the book. He was maybe worried about the ridicule it would bring to the Catholic Church, or why did he tell her not to name names? It would have been such a scandal, Jamie. I mean, keep in mind, 1936 is this attempted infiltration. In 1937, Pope Pius XI released the encyclical Divini Redemptoris, which called communism a satanic scourge orchestrated by the sons of darkness. Where did communism come from, asked the Catholic Church? It answered from the pit of hell. And the church has been saying this since Pope Pius IX's encyclical, Qui Pluribus, in 1846, two years before the Communist Manifesto was even published. So at that point, you're going on almost 100 years. Well, actually, at that point, yeah, when Bella Dodd told Fulton Sheen, you're going to, over 100 years of the church has been consistently calling communism evil, satanic. It's the middle of the Cold War. So if, at that moment, if Fulton Sheen would have come out and said, I've got terrible news for you, but the communists have even tried to infiltrate our church. Um, first of all, the communists would have denied it. And worst of all, Jamie, what would our buddies on the left have done, right? They would have made fun of Sheen. They would have done exactly what the communists done. They would have parroted what the communists did. Oh, well, Fulton Sheen's hanging around with Joe McCarthy, right? Oh, is there a red under the pew, Bishop Sheen? Oh, look, look, yeah. the communist under there. Hmm. And, and the, the communists would have would have said that. The liberals would have echoed it. They would have ridiculed him. In fact, it reminds me of Pope John Paul II when, um, and I reported this in my, in my book, A Pope and a President, when uh, George H.W. Bush's ambassador to the Vatican goes to John Paul II in 1990 and said, um, you know, Holy Father, we've been investigating this and we want to tell you that... Um, we know that the communists were behind the attempted the attempt on your life on May 13th, 1981. And what did John Paul II say? I know. And I don't want you to talk about it because I don't want you to cause trouble. I don't want it to cause World War III. And besides, the communists will deny it, right? And he probably knew and the liberals will jump in and join them, right? And, and what's done is done. So the best you could do is fight it. 
So what Fulton Sheen told Bella Dodd, and Bella Dodd said, Bishop Sheen, I feel so bad about what I did that I want to go join the most penitential religious order on the planet and spend the rest of my life on my knees making reparation for this evil that I committed. Mm -hmm. And he said, no, no, here's what I want you to do. First of all, I don't want you to name names, all right? But I want you to go out and tell the world about the evils of communism. Go out and fight the beast. And that's what she did. That's yeah. what she did very courageously. So in Sheen's estimation, that was the best way to go about it. Yeah. Um, look, Paul, I mean, obviously Fulton Sheen, uh, such a great man, connected, of course, I think, to the divine. So who am I to speak? But there's still some, there's a few legitimate arguments that could be made that naming some names may have been important. But I understand that this was a very tough issue and everything you've said, of course, makes a lot of sense. Very tough. Um, let me just get a quick word from our sponsors. Hello, I'm Mike Lindell. Years ago, when I invented my pillow, I was faced with every adversity you could think of. No retailers wanted to sell my pillow. That's come full circle. Vendors took advantage of me, and I was copied by China. Well, by the grace of God, I was able to get through all that and learn from it. I have a passion to help other U.S. entrepreneurs, and that's why I created my new platform, MyStore.com. We have hundreds of products from amazing entrepreneurs, and to celebrate, I'm going to put my pillows on MyStore.com right now. You can get my standard my pillows regularly, $69.98, now only $19.98 with your promo code. Or you can get my standard queen size, regular $79.98, now only $29.98. Or you can get my premium king size, regularly $89.98, now only $34.98. So go to mystore.com and use that promo code on your screen to get huge discounts on all my store products. Thank you and God bless. And we are back with the great Professor Paul Kangor. We're talking about the Soviet infiltration of the Vatican and much else. Uh, Paul, you mention in your book, I, I, I hope I pronounce his name right, the author, John Collier, The Spies in the Vatican, his book. Uh, incredible book, and he touches on this issue. So look, obviously something happened here in terms of what Bella Dodd was sharing and revealing that she had overseen these, these thousand infiltrators that they put into the seminaries, etc. Because when you think about it, in terms of even Fatima with Sister Lucia, that the third secret of Fatima was supposed to be released by 1960, somewhere around there, but it wasn't. And the message of Fatima was suffocated. And then as, as, as we know, something happened to the real Sister Lucia. Then even with Vatican II, as you document, uh, softness on communism, no denouncing communism, not even a mentioning of communism. It doesn't take a genius to figure out that the Vatican had been infiltrated by these horrible forces and they were making deals with the KGB, right? Yeah, uh, well, so that, and that's the big question, right? To what extent did that happen? Now, yeah. um, Bella Dodd apparently told Alice von Hildebrand, Alice von Hildebrand talked about this, and Dietrich von Hildebrand, that there may have been four cardinals, right, um, who, who were corrupted, and which just leaves us begging, you know, who, who were they? Who, who were they? And, yes. we, and, we, and we don't know, but you know, we have a chapter in the book on how, how Vatican II absolutely blew it on the issue of communism. I mean, that should have been a major, there should have been a major statement there against communism, consistent with all these encyclicals from Pius the Ninth through Leo the Thirteenth, Pius the Eleventh, the Twelfth, all the way up through. I mean, you even had John the Twenty Third saying that, that communism was wrong. A Catholic can't be a socialist at the same time a Catholic. So it's all there for Vatican II set up to tee off right um, against communism, but they didn't do it. They relegated the condemnations to like a footnote. It, it, it was scandalous. And so my co-author and I speculate, and here's one area where we speculate. We don't speculate about whether or not um, Bella Dodd said what she said. We document that she said what she, what she said. But could, could a result of the infiltration of the church been this softness of communism at Vatican II? Quite possibly. And I think another area where you could make the case would be something even more direct, liberation theology. 
Mm-hmm. You, know, you mentioned Malachi Martin a couple times. He wrote the book The Jesuits. You know, look look at liberation theology. Clearly, that was Marxism or socialism entering into the church in Latin America. So so there there was a corrupting influence. Did it directly come? from specifically what Bella Daw did? I don't know, because of the thousand that she might have tried to help to recruit to place in the church, I don't know, Jamie, I'd be surprised if a hundred got through because, because of the commitment that you have to go through and you've got to prove yourself in seminary. But as you know, and as I quote Manning Johnson and others saying, sometimes you only need 10 to 100 people in an entire organization to corrupt it. Sometimes you only need one person. <laughs> right. L- like, a, like a pope like a pope right right yeah i mean truly i mean so and manning johnson said you could take a handful of people but uh, we we quote bella dodd saying and also congressional investigators affirming she put a thousand to fifteen hundred communist teachers in the new york state teachers union yeah so to put a thousand priests in 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 a priesthood of sixty thousand american catholic priests she probably saw that as a cinch He's- and 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 it's also not even physical bodies, but the things that they say and spawn and engender that can spread in terms of words. Right, right. And they don't oh. even have to be out there passing around, you know, the Communist Manifesto in the pews. I mean, they could be spouting a bunch of gibberish about social justice. Yeah, yeah. That's really their cloaked form of socialism or wealth redistribution yeah. that is some way Marxist in orientation. Well, we have a pope that's w- through these synods uh, just waging a war on the mass and on the Eucharist, and what he's going to try to do in the next year or two. This is very frightening, uh, and uh, in many respects, a sign of our times. We're keeping an eye on it. Paul, let me ask this: uh, At one time, we thought that maybe the CIA and FBI were doing good things for America, and uh, you know, I don't know. Like now. I studied the Kennedy assassination for a long time, even now recently. It's turning out very troubling things about the CIA and they're still hiding certain things. Now we're wondering FBI. We thought FBI looking out for American interests, but for some reason they invade uh, Trump's home. I'm still waiting. When are they going to invade Hunter Biden's home? When are they going to invade Joe Biden's home, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm mentioning the FBI now because now we have to reflect on whether the FBI is really pursuing the good interests of our country. Uh, They're still keeping a lot of things classified in terms of Bella Dodd. You were able to get some documents, but unable to get others. Yeah, it's pretty extraordinary. I I first, uh, through a friend of mine who's an attorney who specializes in FOIA requests, Freedom of Information Act requests, Mm -hmm. I started filing FOIA requests on Bella Dodd three or four years ago. And uh, I mean, Jamie, this woman died in 1969 mm. and her FBI file still hadn't been released yet. And, and we ended up getting through several batches, 1,281 pages, I think, of her FBI file. And even mm. then, it's just the tip of the iceberg. Mm. And when I saw the listing of all of different Bella Dodd materials and different agencies and archives and and you know recesses of the of the of the federal beast in Washington. I thought I don't know who could ever get through all of this. There is so much material here. I don't know how you go about ordering it. I don't know who's going to clear. It. I don't even know how you submit a request for some of these things. I don't think anybody will ever be able to go through it. But the amount the amount of material on Bella Dodd that still has just never been seen by researchers is astonishing. Uh, you know, far more has been released on the Rosenbergs, probably even on Lee Harvey Oswald than, mm. <laughs> than, than on Bella Dodd, which makes me wonder if there is some material in there about infiltration of the churches. Um, but but I, I don't know, I can't say that because, because, I ha- because I haven't seen the material. But it was an enormous amount of information. By the way, the the Senate investigators called her the Falcon because she turned out to be this strong woman w- willing to willing to fight the party. Thank you, Paul. You also touch on communism itself uh, and why it's so anti-God, why, why it's so satanic. Let's just talk about that for a minute because it's very deceptive. 
And as you know that, you know, communism is very appealing because it, it reaches out for the will to good, you know? And so there's always this hypnotic thing about, you know, we're doing good and social justice and we're gonna, you know, create equality, etc. And then all of a sudden, you know, millions of people are being massacred and killed and they're destroying everything. But overall, materialism, materialism, no belief in the human soul, the rejection of the individual, the rejection of private property. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, in fact, in the church described communism and communists as wolves in sheep's clothing from mm -hmm. the very beginning. Um, it's interesting, isn't it, that the, that the coat of arms for the, for the Fabians, the Fabian socialists, is literally a wolf in sheep's clothing. And if, in fact, people could, could probably looking that up, typing that up right now into their computer and uh, see, check it out. <laughs> there they are, a whole wolf in sheep's clothing. And they think it's cute. They think it's funny, right? Of course, it's not cute. It's not funny. It's, it's, it's evil. It's deceptive. And, and the communists always thrived on that. I quote in the book, I think it was Herb Philbrick who had infiltrated the party and then testified about it to Congress. He, he wrote the book, I Led Three Lives, which also became a, a TV series. And Philbrick was told by one of the party organizers that if you were asked, if, uh, if you were asked by a committee somewhere, a legislative committee, if you're a communist, you are to put your hand on a stack of Bibles this high, the communist organizer told him, right? And, and just lie and say, say, no, I am not, and I never have been. And for them, it was easy to put their hand on a stack of Bibles that high and lie because they didn't believe in the stack of Bibles. They believed in this strictly material world. I quote in the book, we quote in the book, even Dorothy Day's Catholic worker saying to, saying to Earl Browder and the Communist Party with their outstretched hand effort in the 1930s, you know, no, we can't go there. We might agree with you guys on, on workers and a maybe a more equitable redistribution of wealth, but you people reject the idea of the soul. You reject mm. the God. You God, you reject our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You believe mm. in the strictly material. You think that there is no hereafter. And they also pointed out too, you thrive on hate and envy. Uh, mm. you, just just as Hitler, Hit, Hitler hated people according to race. The communists hate people according to class, according mm. to economics. So, so, you know, we might have some common ground with you in some areas, but we cannot be like you. We cannot support you in what you do. And that ought to be a, a lesson to religious left uh, Christians and believers today who think, uh, oh, look at this, the Old Testament, New Testament. They talk about sharing. Oh, just like the communists, <laughs> yeah. no. you know, come on, you know, the communists drank water too, just like I did. Oh, they yeah. like water. I guess maybe I ought to be a communist. I, yeah. I mean, it's, it's such sophistry. It's such uh, muddled, silly thinking. Uh, mm. But, but so many of our people today, including our friends on the religious left are easily duped and taken in by, uh, by that deception. And Bella talks about how the party was so good using words like democracy she said oh yeah democracy they use that word all the time democracy democracy yeah. democracy they had the jefferson school they called it in new york they had the abraham lincoln brigade they called it in the spanish civil war they had the abe lincoln schools right throughout the country yeah you know, they taught uh, uh, they they wrote what is this howard fast wrote the book citizen tom Paine. right yeah they 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 they, they co-opted the founders they lied and lied and lied all the time because too many people on the left too easily fell for it yes thank you so much paul um sometimes i try to find the words for these things because they're so this is such a deep thing that you, in communism, the end is, is you're pointing out and documented so well in your book, um, but the individual is made invisible. Everything is for the collective and serving the state. And so that's the beauty of America, founded on Judeo-Christian tradition and on these principles, that the individual 
uh, there's something sacred about the individual, the autonomy of the individual, the, 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 the autonomy, the sacredness, the rights of the individual. But I often think about Jesus Christ dying on the cross for every single one of us and that each person can know that Christ's death on the cross is for us personally, that he loves each of us as an individual. And I think definitely that communism wants to erase that. And also making humans gods, because we know that communists and leftists, they're self-appointed redeemers, aren't they? They get to decide who are the damned and who are going to be the anointed. In communism, our creators removed and humans make themselves gods, don't they? Yeah, in fact, Whitaker Chambers said at the start of Witness, he said that the first mistake of the communists is the first mistake of humanity in the Garden of Eden, right? The belief that ye shall be as gods. Mm -hmm. uh, and Fulton Sheen said the difference, the main difference between communists and, and, and Christians is that for, for Christians, Jesus's tomb is empty, but Lenin's tomb is not. And Lenin's tomb is just this rotting flesh of this miserable man who uh, echoed Marx, said religion is the opiate of the masses. It is a kind of spiritual booze, a medieval mildew. Lenin said there is nothing more abominable than religion. All worship of, a re of religion is a necrophilia. Well, so is putting Lenin in a tomb dead yeah. in what you call Lenin's shrine and going up and in reverence, right, quietly what you're know, sauntering past the tomb of, 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 of Lenin. But yeah, that's the that's the first mistake. And and the Judeo-Christian view is that human beings are made in the Omago Dei, in the image of God. And, yeah. and communists completely reject that. You know, communists pit human beings into different categories. Bourgeoisie proletariat, oppressed oppressor. And your category defines you. The critical race theorists do the same thing according to race, right? But but they put people in different categories. The Christian, Judeo-Christian view says, no, all human beings are made in the image of God. They all have inherent dignity. Every life is precious. Every person has a soul. Every human being is eternal. The communists said there is no such thing as eternal. There is no such thing as a soul. And when you think that way, you can abort as many babies as you want. You can kill over 100 million people if you want. You can kill them by tens of millions in the gulag because there's nothing that matters to them but the here and now. Absolutely. And what matters to us that love Christ and our Creator is what was on Bella Dodd's mind all the time as you document that while she was working for this pure materialistic class war, she kept thinking of Jesus in the desert being tempted and saying, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth from the mouth of God. And that, I think, right there in one sentence is the greatest, most profound discrediting of the, of the socialist lie. Um, Socialists and communists think that man lives by bread alone. And, and as Pope Benedict XVI said, they thought the new Jerusalem would be ushered in if you could just solve the economic problem, right? But Absolutely. as Jesus told Satan, no, man does not live by bread alone. Augustine said we have a God-shaped vacuum in each of us, not a dollar-shaped vacuum in each of us, right? We, we are spiritual beings. We need spiritual fulfillment. We need God. You don't just solve the human problem by solving the economic problem through Marx's worship of capital. He calls the free marketers capitalists. Marx was the was the ultimate worshiper of ca all Marx thought of was money and capital. That was his alpha and omega. Solve the capital problem, solve the economic problem, solve the class problem, and you've solved the human problem. No, yeah. man does not live by bread alone. Amen. Uh, Paul Kengor, I wish we had another eight hours to speak. We got to go. Thank you so much for writing this book. Am I correct that everybody should go to faithandfreedom.com? Well, that is that is our website at Grove City College. Uh, but to order the book, go to amazon.com or Tan Books, The Devil and Bella Dodd. Um, also, check out my writings. I have a weekly column for the American Spectator at spectator.org. 
Fantastic. Uh, Professor Kangor, thank you for being a gentleman and a scholar. Thank you for writing this book. Well, thank you, Jamie. You're always too kind. God bless. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, The Devil and Bella Dodd. Read it and check out all of Professor Paul Kengor's work and visit faithandfreedom.com. We'll see you soon on the Glass Off Gang. Good night.